Hi everyone, welcome back. My name is Lon Schiffbauer, and today we are going to talk about global marketing. So let's jump right into it. Now, global marketing is, well, folks, it's marketing. Marketing is marketing. However, when we're talking about global marketing, we need to really amp up our consideration of all of the four P's of marketing. That's right, we're gonna talk about the four P's. This means we need to really think about our audience and the segmentation and the infrastructure in place in the various regions and countries in which we'd like to do business. So let's go ahead and go through this, understanding that we're going to need to explore a lot of the questions we raise in depth when it comes to doing business globally. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pick up my marker here. Hey, highlighter, how you doing? All right. So, yes, global marketing is like any other marketing endeavor. We have a marketing mix that we have to take into account. And that includes, you guessed it, the four P's. We need to look at the product, the price, the place, which is really distribution, and promotion. Okay, we'll explore all of these. But we also need to think about the market segment. All right, let's take a look at this. A distinct group of customers whose purchasing habits differ from the larger population in important ways. Oh my gosh, this with an exclamation mark because we are talking about marketing to populations that are very different from ourselves or other places in which we have plied our trade. And so we really need to consider in depth our marketing segment when marketing globally. All right, so with that in mind, let's explore some of this. When we need to think about global marketing, we need to recognize that, well, you know what? We're gonna vary our marketing mix from country to country, depending on differences in national culture, economic development, product development, distribution channels, etc. Okay, we're going to talk about all kinds of things that really make global marketing a different creature. To do that, let's start with the product. All right, we're going to we're going to sell a product or service. Let's explore that. Well, a product is the you know, whatever we're going to provide to the customer to satisfy a need or a want. Well, right away, different people in different countries have different needs and wants than what we may be used to. Um, it's, it's kind of this sense of, well, when you live in an environment your whole life, you kind of have this myopic understanding of what the needs and wants of your typical person may be but go to another country and those needs and wants differ vastly. So you need to really take the time to understand your target audience, perhaps more than ever. All right. You need to also understand what is the total product offering that you are providing. All the benefits associated with a good or service or idea that affects customers' purchasing decision. All right. So as it says here, when you're, you know, selling a car or buying a car, you're not just buying something that moves you from point A to point B. You're also kind of buying a style, an image, prestige, things like that. All right. Let's explore this in a little bit more depth. What we first have is our core product. Now, I'm going to use, for example, in this pizza, because I like pizza. And right now it's Friday as I'm shooting this and Friday is pizza night. Okay. So pizza, what's the core product? Is it the pizza? No, 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 no. The core product is the calories that it provides and the fact that it can relieve me from hunger. All right. That's what we eat food for. Energy, the calories, and I'm hungry. I don't like being hungry. Make that hungry stuff go away. Okay, that's the core product. All right, but then we have the actual product, all right? The actual thing we can touch, the 
tangible product. Here we're talking about the crust and the cheese and sauce toppings, the packaging. This is the actual tangible product, all right? But then we're putting together the core with the actual plus augmented product, right? Such as the, you know, delivery service or the sort of image of the pizza company from whom we are buying this pizza or the ambiance of their establishment. These are things that kind of augment the value proposition of the product. And this is going to be important when we talk about pricing. Okay. So we need a product, which means we need to generate an idea for a product. Now, Understand, remember, it may be that this one simple product that you already have may not sell abroad. You may need to localize your product, find a product that meets the unique um, needs and desires and tastes of your local market. So let's look at how we might do this. The first thing we do is we need to generate some ideas, right? So salespeople bring ideas and suggestions to you to say, hey, I've kind of looked at the market and they really like this. So for this example, let's look at a fast food restaurant, right? Remember, McDonald's wants to maintain low prices, but they want to have a localized menu. So salespeople need to talk to people over in the region where they're trying to set up a McDonald's and figure out, what do these folks like, all right? Then we go ahead and screen some ideas. Maybe we go ahead and, you know, manufacture, let's see, research the possible customer, de customer demand for this new item. So, for example, I used to live in Japan, and when you go to McDonald's, yes, there would be squid dishes and so forth. Um, so they want to kind of screen these ideas, test them out a little bit. Then they do a product analysis. This is where we estimate the new foods, um, production costs, selling price, sales volume. Even if you have something that was a great idea and people loved it, well, then you'd have to look at, well, how much would this cost to produce? And furthermore, how much are people willing to pay for it? And is there a sufficient margin for it? And would it sell enough and would it be a, you know, popular enough of a product that we could keep it around and really get a return on our investment? You need to look at these things. So then you go ahead and develop it and you test it. You know, you put it together, you offer it in some test markets, maybe do some pilots and so forth, maybe a little promotional. We'll talk about that to test out if people are really into this squid burger that you're making in Japan. Then you have market, you're developing your marketing and your media mix, okay? Your marketing mix. So fast food manufacturer produces a physical product and the marketing department determines how to price, promote, and place the new product to get customer feedback and response and so forth. Then you really go out and test market your product heavily. And then once you're all set and you've said, yeah, everything's working the way we want it to work, you can go ahead and commercialize it. All right. Now, this is for a new product. But here's the thing about products. Everything tends to go through a product life cycle. I say everything. Let's just say most products tend to go through a product life cycle. That means we introduce it and not too many people are really buying it or anything. It's kind of new, but then it goes through growth and it really goes up during growth, right? And then we hit maturity and things tend to flatten out during maturity. And then you've got decline. This is where things really drop off. Okay, well, what happens if you have a product that is starting to go into maturity or maybe even decline, all right? What can you do? Well, there are a few things you can do. You can lower your prices. 
maybe after all this time, you've figured out some economies of scale and you can introduce new efficiencies to the production process such that you can lower the price, but still make your profit margins. Um, you can figure out new uses, right? I mean, this is for cu current customers. Think about, I don't know, duct tape, right? Duct tape supposedly manufactured to put together ducts, right? Well, duct tape is a great example of new uses. Everybody uses duct tape for all kinds of things, right? Um, you could even think about, um, oh, I don't know, post-it notes, things that were originally used in offices, but now homes have them all over the place. Schools have them all over the place. You're talking about new uses for existing customers. But then you can look for new markets. Well, now this is where global marketing really comes into play because you might have a product that is starting to get a little long in the tooth, starting to mature and maybe even decline a little bit. Well, that's here locally. But if you go went off and marketed that product in a new region or a new country, you could extend the life of your product. Of course, you've seen new labels and new packaging, right? Oh my gosh, they're always changing labels and packaging. It's a way to extend the life of a product. And then you can get new versions, right? Attempt to reposition the product as something new, something wow and so forth. So for example, I'm seeing commercials right now for the Apple um, iPhone 12, and the commercials are promoting that it can come in purple. Yay, purple. That's about as far as innovation goes with Apple these days, right? But they're still trying to say, hey, it's a new version. Okay. That takes us then to price. We've got the first P, product. We figured that out. But then we got to figure out how to price this bad boy, right? Now, here's the thing. Let's understand the difference between price and value, because trust me, your customers know the difference. Price is what customers are actually willing to pay for an item. What are you willing to pay? That's the price. We're set. However, value, value the customer's derived benefit of the total product offer minus the costs associated with purchasing, owning, and disposing of the product. Okay, think about this, right? If a customer, if I pay, oh, here's a little, here's a Bluetooth speaker, all right? Uh, I don't know, I paid 50 bucks, 40 bucks, something like that. But if I'm willing to pay $40 for this, for this Bluetooth speaker, that means that I perceive that the value I get out of this speaker, right, the benefit I, I get from buying the speaker is greater than the cost of the money, than the packaging that I have to throw away, and the cost of ownership, meaning recharging the thing all the time and pairing it with my various devices, that's a pain in the butt, but I perceive that it's worth it, right? And then the cost of disposal, right? So a customer needs to perceive that the value that they're getting from a product outweighs the price. So price is pretty important. All right. Now, why is it important? Well, it is the only 4P that actually generates money, right? So product, manufacturing a product, that's a cost. Place, that's a cost. Distribution. And then promotion, that's a cost. In fact, promotion is probably the most important cost, right? So all of these things are, cost, are, are costs. Price is the only thing that generates revenue. So you want to make sure you do it right. All right. Um, it is a marketing tool used in promotional campaigns. So you want to make sure that it, it you know, doesn't offset the value in the minds of the customer. Helps differentiate the product from the competition. 
um, the factor in determining profit. And it's challenging. If you're going to make a profit, if you're going to stay in business, let alone grow your business, you better make sure your, your price is set right. And I'm going to tell you, it ain't easy, right? I personally, and feel free to contact me and say, tell me more, Lon. I have a really difficult time determining the price of my products and services. It's very difficult. So don't dismiss this. All right. There's different ways of doing it, right? Of figuring out your cost. You can do cost-based, figuring out your price. Cost-based, I'm going to just tell you right now, this is the least effective and it's the one I tend to go to. Oh my gosh. I'm miserable at this. Cost base basically says, well, I am going to calculate how much it costs for me to produce this product. And then I am going to take that amount and increase it by 20%. So I'm getting 20% profit, right? Okay, that's fine, I guess, right? But now here's the problem. What if the market is not willing to pay that. Well, now you've figured out how much it costs for you to make something and you increase it by 20% and the market says that's too expensive. Well, then you bring it down to 10% and the market says, eh, right? Or on the other hand, let's say that you figure out how much it takes to produce it, increase it by 20% and the market says, I'm all over that because you are priced way cheaper than you really should be. And so now you get too much demand and you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off, trying to figure out how to meet the demand. All the while, you're not really making it worth your while to deliver the product because you're only making 20% profit. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about because that's what I tend to do. The better way to go is say demand-based. Demand just basically says, hey, we're going to price it on what the market will bear. How much are you going to sell it for? How much are you willing to pay for it? Oh, well, I'm willing to pay $500 for it. Done. Doesn't matter that it costs me $300 to make it, so I'm making like $200 on it. You don't need to know that. Or it took me $499 and you're willing to pay $500, I'm still making a dollar. If I do enough, enough in volume, I can make money, right? It's whatever the market will bear. Or you can go competition-based, which is, hey, what's going on with the competition? Where are they pricing it? If they're pricing it at $500, maybe I'll match it $500. Maybe I'll go in at $499 and try to, you know, cut it off just a little bit. Maybe I'll go $501 just to kind of say I'm a little different. Or you can just say, hey, we're going with everyday low pricing. We are going to figure out the absolute cheapest we can sell this thing for no matter what. And that's what we're going to sell it at. And because we are the absolute cheapest, we are going to sell the most. And so we'll make money on volume. Okay. Four different pricing strategies. Now, you need to figure out, okay, well, which strategy, Lon? The strategy should be based on what your objective is, right? And what you're good at. Remember, we talked about international strategies before. What, what are your core competencies? What are your values? What's happening in the industry and in the marketplace? Same sort of thing goes on here. So let's look at pricing objectives you may have. You may say, you know what? We want to maximize profits. We want profits, right? Um, and that makes really good sense. Um, and it's a great way to just maximize your revenue, right? And to bring about um, aggressive growth. Okay. And that works if you've got the right product with the right services and the market can, you know, accommodate that, especially if there's not a lot of competition, right? You can just go for, we're maximizing profits. Um, you could go for greater market share. We talked about market share in our video on um, international strategies. Market share is basically, hey, we have 12% of the market 
we want 15% of the market. So you're going to price yourself to be more attractive to the consumer than the competition. Because basically with market share, what you're trying to do is steal customers. You're not trying to develop a new market. You're basically just stealing share from other um, competitors. Um, you might say, I want to maximize sales, right? Maximize sales means low prices. It may reduce, it may result in losses. Well, now, why would you, why would you want to take a loss on something? Well, maybe you're trying to get rid of a bunch of inventory. You might have a ton of inventory and it's just killing you. We talked about um, operational um, excellence and so forth and inventory. Um, and inventory is expensive and it depreciates in value, that thing that you're holding in inventory. So you may be like, you know what? We got to get rid of this now. So we're just going to maximize sales. It could be that you want to build traffic. All right. Um, increase visits to the location, increase purchases of both bargain and profitable things, right? So the idea is, it's like, okay, here in the United States, we often have Black Friday, or, or is it Black Friday? Gosh, yeah, Black Friday sales. That's what it's called. Black Friday sales right after Thanksgiving. And the idea is bring in a lot of customers with these super, super, super low prices on a few items. So customers come in, buy these really cheap items, but they also buy other things that are much more profitable, right? So yeah, you're building traffic and getting a strong customer base. And yeah, you might take a loss on a few things, but you're going to make a lot of money on a few others, right? You might just match the status quo prices, right? You don't want a price war. You just want to compete on non-price factors such as functionality, availability, service, ease of maintenance, things like that. That's where you really want to do your, your competition. You might also just say, hey, we just want to cover costs. I want to break even. It's just a break even proposition, right? It'll help build a customer base and generate sales, but not profits. But if you have a customer base, that's something you can build upon later on. So early as you move into a country, you might just say, hey, we're not going to make money the first year we're there. We're not going to make any money. We just want to establish ourselves, get in the customer's mindset, bring them in, and then later on we can start looking at making money, okay? Especially good in poor and unstable markets, that's the way to go. It could be you want to create an image, right? Luxury cars, luxury handbags, shoes, perfume, and so on and so forth. It's a funny thing. If you are priced too low, you'll never create a positive image, right? This is where you actually increase the price just because people want to feel special, right? Um, and then finally, it could just be that your pricing strategy is affordability to all. This is really where governments get into, um, into play. And if you're doing business in a more social um, socialism government than more on the free market side, you'll find that in many cases, they will want to control prices a little bit because their goal is not to maximize profits. Their goal is to make everything as affordable and accessible to everyone involved. So maybe that's how you'll need to do your pricing, okay? Now, one thing that's interesting about doing business globally is you don't necessarily need to charge the same price in every country in which you do business. Price discrimination basically says, hey, you charge what the market will bear. Um, if in one market... Um, they're, they're okay about your product and it sells all right and you can make some money and so forth. All right, you're going to lower your prices because you want to compete and, and stay in the market and make a little bit. Um, but in another market, you maybe the very same product is like nuts popular. I mean, it's just the cat's meow. Everybody loves your product. 
Well, now you can charge more. All right. It's what the market will bear. And so what a lot of companies will do when they're out there, you know, running their multinational companies or at least doing business in different countries, they'll figure out what products do best in what countries. And they might make sure that they sell products, their products in countries that pay less just to make sure they maintain a presence. Um, but they'll really focus in those markets where they can get the greatest return from their product. Okay, so we got product, we got price. Now let's look at place or distribution, right? Place is all the steps to get the product from production to the consumer, um, making it convenient to buy. That's what place is all about. How do you remove all the barriers possible? How do you make, make it as frictionless as possible for the consumer to buy your product? That's what place is all about. Every aspect of it, okay? Now, part of that is distribution, actually moving the product and making it available, right? The process that makes products available to consumers when and where the consumers want them through marketing intermediaries. Okay, what do we mean by that? All right, let me tell you. So uh, let's see. Let's say that um, you, you are off in India, okay? I'm talking to some of my Indian uh, uh, viewers. And you have a product, okay? Now, I want to buy it. I want to buy it. Let's say, what's your product? Okay, your product is mango juice. When I was in India, I had the best mango juice I've ever had in my entire life. It was amazing. And oh, by the way, in India, they also have these little bananas, tiny bananas, only about that big. And they are so good. I love bananas. I'm a banana freak, right? But these things were amazing. Anyway, you're selling mango juice. I want to buy your mango juice. How are you going to get it to me? Well, all right. Are you going to just sell it directly to me? All right, you could, right? You could go ahead and set up a website. Even a website has an intermediary. We'll talk about that. But let's just say that you find a way to sell it to me directly, right? Maybe you and I are on LinkedIn together, right? Maybe I'm talking to somebody who I'm on LinkedIn with and you say, hey, you want to buy some mango juice? I say, you bet. And I send you some money and you ship it to me. All right, great. That's not going to really scale very well, right? So maybe you say, well, I need to go through a retailer, Right. So, Lon, you shop at Walmart and Harmons. So I want to get into that retailer. All right. And then I buy your mango juice from India from that retailer. All right. That's fine. But how does the retailer get their materials? Do they buy directly from producers? Well, now, in the case of Harmons, where I shop, they often do. They often do buy direct from producers. And furthermore, they have a huge international. I mean, the whole store has a whole bunch of international and locally produced foods. And so you might be able to do that. But most of the time, a retailer will get things from a wholesaler. So you selling your mango juice, you'll go to a wholesaler and say, we want to sell you a whole bunch of, of mango juice so that a whole bunch of retailers, whether it's Walmart or Harmons or Safeway or Albertsons or anywhere else, right? These are all American brands. I don't know too many international grocery stores, but you get the idea. Um, they can buy from this wholesaler. So maybe you sell there. Well, now in some cases, a wholesaler says, you know what? We just work with brokers, man. And so a broker is somebody who takes on tons and tons and tons of product that is in high demand all over the world. And then they work with wholesalers. So take, for example, um, let's say Levi jeans. It's an American product, Levi jeans. Levi's are sold everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Okay. 
So Levi's will sell to a broker who will then sell to international wholesalers, who will then sell to international retailers, who then sell to international customers. Now, obviously, every one of these people want to cut, right? And so this is where pricing becomes really important as well. You got to figure out how close can I get to the customer without having to spend a whole lot of money on all the intermediaries. That's kind of the, 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 the chess game of distribution. Okay. Now, oftentimes, and I'm speaking to my, to my American students for a moment, when we think about distribution, we think about trucks, trains, boats, that sort of thing. Okay, that's fine. Because we have a given infrastructure that says that trucks, trains, and boats make the most sense. However, those are far from the only distribution channels that we have, right? Um, you might look at Coca-Cola using wheelbarrows and bicycles as distribution channels and go, that's kind of ridiculous. Not at all. Not at all. Given the infrastructure in place, if you're delivering to villages that are in these dirt roads and, and so forth, a wheelbarrow is the way to go, baby, right? Um, bicycles, New York uses bicycles, right? When those couriers that are sending off stuff all over the, the city, they use bicycles all the time. In China, food is distributed through mopeds and scooters. Mopeds and scooters feed a nation in China, right? Here in the U.S., we have things like Grubhub and delivery pizza and so forth. They're using a whole frickin' car to deliver a little bag of food? That's nuts. Well, we have, a, we have roads that'll allow that. But if you're in a big city in Japan or China, uh, same thing goes with Japan and scooters and so forth. If you want ramen in Japan delivered, it's coming on a scooter. It's because those little things are zooming. They can get around. You want to figure out the best form of distribution for your region. Do not assume that everything is delivered in great big huge trucks. Okay, this brings us to the last one, promotion, all right? This is, these are all the methods that we use to inform and persuade customers to buy and to basically build a positive customer relationship. Uh, this is the most visible and the most expensive aspect of the four Ps, right? Um, there's any number of distribution channels out there. Holy smoke. You know, you've got direct mail, newspapers, television, newspapers, magazine, radio, internet, social media, mobile, outdoor, infomercials, the list goes on. It's not a menu. It's not, ooh, I really like social media. I'm going to use that one. Oh, you know what? Me newspapers, they're so passe. I'm not going to use newspapers. No. You are going to use the channels that work best for your target audience in the country in which you are doing business. Okay? And the country in which you're doing business may say the infomercials are illegal. May say the outdoor advertising not the way to go. They may not really have good, strong, free market social media systems in place. Um, they may have tons of newspapers. They may have tons of, of magazines and so forth. Uh, direct mail may not be an option. You get the idea. You need to really understand your target segment. You need to understand the distribution and promotional infrastructure of the country in which you are doing business. Do not assume that everybody is like whatever region you're in yourself right now. Okay. You also need to understand your, your target audience because there are a lot of barriers that will get in the way if you're not careful. Cultural barriers, right? 
advertising, for example, is is often successful if it has a little bit of an edge to it, a little bit of a social edge, a little bit of humor, something that connects with you. It makes it easy to remember and you can see yourself in that commercial, if you will. Um, yeah, that is very, very culturally based, right? So you take this ad from uh, Colors of Benetton for a moment, right? Okay, this ad might have run just fine in Europe. Colors of Benetton. Um, oh, gosh, I forget. Where's Benetton based? It's a European country. I apologize. I forget where Benetton is pay based. I need to look that up. Um, maybe this ran fine in India, because uh, in, in the region in which this ran. Because maybe it was meant to say, "Hey, we're in this together. We're all, we're we're all um, equal, and yada yada." And look, we're wearing the same clothes and everything, and our our future is inextricably tied to one another. We are a collective people. All right. In the United States, that is not the message it sent. Okay. In the United States, this ad. I, 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 this is one of our taboos, something we talked about in the video on, uh, on, um, on culture and so forth. These are mores and taboos, uh, mores, the idea of race relations and so forth. This is really bad in the U S well, trust me, you're going to think of all kinds of advertising that will be really, really bad in your region, in the area in which you want to do business. So you need to understand the culture of your target audience. Now you also need to uh, understand source effects and country of origin effect. All right. What's this? Well, source effect is in both of them when the receiver evaluates the message in part based on his or her image of the sender. In the case of source, it's the company. In the case of country of origin, it's, well, the country, right? So, for example, here in the United States, and by the way, in Germany as well, um, later on in a different video, we'll talk about why Walmart failed in Germany, okay? Um, I believe it's the next one on HR. So, they failed horribly in, in, in Germany for a variety of reasons, which we'll discuss. Here in the United States, even though Walmart is the you know, largest employer and largest retail and so forth. It has a lot of bad press. A lot of uh, a lot of folks perceive um, Walmart as an unethical con company that they don't want to support. True or not, that's the perception, right? Or take the phrase "made in China." Well, now, here in the United States, let's face it, everything's made in China. They do really, really well. All right. China knows manufacturing. Um, so made in China today doesn't have the same connotations. But there was a time in the past in the United States where made in China or made in Japan meant cheap garbage. That's not the case anymore. Today, China and Japan make incredible stuff, and we love it. I'm shooting this bad boy right now on a Sony camera. I love it. Made in Japan. You better believe I love that thing, right? But depending, you might be selling from a country that does not have a positive reputation in the country in which you're trying to do business. So you need to take that into account. Um Apple, for example, I don't know if they still do it, but on the back of my wife's iPad, it says designed in Cupertino manu or assembled in China. And that's where they're trying to, uh, you know, mitigate for the country of origin effect. All right. And then you got to look at noise levels. You got to figure out, oh my gosh, how much is going on out there right now? How much advertising and promotion is out there? In other words, what's the clutter and how are you going to break through that clutter? All right. So 
Let's look at how you would run a campaign in a given country, right? I've got some M&M's examples. Ah, there they are. There they are. M&M's, right? Um, let's, let's look at how we would, do, we would run a campaign. Identify the target market. This is everything. When you're doing global marketing, this is everything. All right. You got to understand these folks. You got to understand their values, their culture, their history, their wants, their needs, their tastes. You've got to ramp this bad boy up to 11. You know, who are you targeting? You know, what, what are they like? Then you got to figure out your market objectives. What are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to build traffic? Are you trying to increase brand awareness? Are you trying to respond to a negative attack from a, a competitor? What are you actually trying to do, right? And this goes back to some of those pricing strategies we talked about before. What's your budget? <laughs> Promotion is expensive. Oh my gosh, it's expensive. And so what's the budget that you have and how much are you willing to invest? Um, and don't just say, oh, I'm going to do social media marketing and guerrilla marketing because you might be going to a country where that's not a viable option. And you might be doing um, uh, business in a country where free speech is, well, curtailed, where speech is controlled. And you might be going someplace that's a lot more expensive than you might think, okay? Then you got to design a message and figure out your channels, right? Given your target audience and your objective, how can you best get the message out there, all right? Once again, what is the promotional infrastructure of the region or country in which you're trying to do business, right? You want to impl implement your promotional mix, right? We're talking advertising, PR, personal sales, sales promotions. What are you going to do there? And then, of course, you need to always evaluate the outcome of your promotions and constantly assess, tweak, change, update, because you are doing business in a dynamic, in a dynamic environment your promotional campaigns need to be equally as dynamic. They need to be flexible and changed to meet the changing needs and wants and desires of your audience. Okay? And folks, there you go. Global marketing in a nutshell. Holy smoke. I hope this was helpful. Um, stick with me. We're getting toward the end of this series, but we still have a lot more to go over. So stick around and let's keep going. And in the meantime, until we speak again, have a fantastic day.